working in the world of aging for a while. So do you see progress? Are you seeing, especially in, in the last few years, is there more interest? Or, is there more money? There's, there's certainly more money and more interest than there was. When I started, it would have been difficult for there to be less interest and less money than there was, whilst it remained, whilst remaining viable. I mean, to give you an example, I once attended a mi- my very first meeting of the British Society for Research on Aging, which was the oldest, it still is actually, the oldest learned society studying aging in the world, you know, illustrious people. The grand total of people who attended was five. Okay. And that included me. Um, now, you know, things are considerably better. You know, the memberships are in the hundreds and this sort of thing. Um, so, yes, we are in one of our lively phases. And I would like that phase to continue. We have some very interesting industrial interest, you know, in, industrial attention now, which I think is absolutely great. I think a lot of the people who have started to take a look at this are far-sighted and cognizant of the risks they are taking and that i think is important you know it, it, it's it's one thing to um you know it's one thing to to have what george bush famously called the vision thing and quite another to not recognize that um, the road to the vision thing could be quite long and quite hard and so I think there's a lot of people who have backgrounds in pharma. They know clinical trials fail, but they also know what the rewards are like. And this is this is new, and I think it's really exciting, particularly for the younger guys, because that that's the environment that really needs to come through. We've got when um, I started in terms of you know mechanisms of aging, there were a few theories up in the air. It's very difficult now to capture the extent to which there was, well, hostility towards the idea that cell senescence existed um, or that it could play a role in aging or things like that. A lot of, it's probably one of the few theories from that time that hasn't fallen by the wayside. And that kind of illustrates to me something you see in a lot of fields, which is it tends to be the theories that get most heavily attacked that have the most robust intellectual work associated with them. Because if everybody nods along, you can get away with anything. But if the moment you stand up, somebody queries your honesty, sanity, and parentage, not necessarily in that order, then uh, you do tend to uh, develop a certain ability to, uh, to look at the holes that people are trying to poke in the arguments. Because sometimes the holes are really there. And so, you know, everybody's theories need to be given the rough house treatment is my general rule, because that's the only, you know, because we're actually not interested, you know, we're not interested in being popular, we're interested in being right. So um, let's try and make sure that, that we are. So, yeah, we've got some good theories that seem to be holding up. There will be more. We've got some industrial interest we get to do things like this, you know, which which is absolutely marvellous, which means that you can actually talk to interested, educated people anyway, which we couldn't have done when I started. You know, I don't think the influence of uh, this uh, kind of medium should be understated, you know. So, yeah, I think there's every reason to be hopeful. Um, that having been said, I don't regard this as... Uh, as a, as a done deal by any stretch of the imagination. Right. So what do you see as the most promising technologies that in, in the aging field right now? That's a, t- that, that's a how long is a piece of string question. What um, most promising technologies for what? Uh, for extending... that covers a, that, co- no, no, that covers a huge that, that covers everything from in care di- in care home diagnostics to uploading your brain onto a computer, which is not actually one I regard as particularly promising for the record. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, just in case, you know. 
But um, I mean, I think I'm I'm going to be terribly vanilla. I think I would be very disappointed if we didn't see a useful indication from at least one Senolytic. Mm. I think that that I think that sooner or later there will be one that ticks all of those that ticks all of those boxes. I think that the TAME study, which some of you may have heard of targeting aging with metformin, the trial design, is going to be critical. And in the sense that this, you know, TAME is not about metformin, at least I think for me. TAME is about this is a completely new way of doing drug trials that will allow us to answer that you know, hypothetical question, if you had magic compound X that would add 50 years to human lifespan, how on earth would you tell? You can't do a 50-year drug trial. But the, you know, and I I think, you know, near Barzilide in particular deserves enormous credit for convening various people, Jim Kirkland as well, I think chipped into that idea, and coming up with that methodology is applicable to anything. And the other thing that I think is really, are really hopeful are the technologies to deal with immune senescence, whether that's looking at thymic rejuvenation, the work of Richard Aspinall, for example, on interleukin-7, very, very interesting area of work. Um, Some of the work from Joan Manick on rapamycin to restore, uh, uh, rapalogs to restore immune function, not rapamycin, you guys should shoot me, Um, Everolemus. But I thought that was one I thought was one of the most exciting papers from a few years ago where a group of 200 or so older people were given eight-week low-dose Everolemus, very well tolerated. Then they were given a flu jab and what you saw was that people who weren't able to make a protective antibody titer were making it, and they seem to have cross-strain protection. There's some evidence of reduced infections in those groups, and so, but the, it, that doesn't hold up universally, having seen the latest work. But that just means that we're into picking the populations who I think can respond. And one of the things I think we have, I think everybody knows, we've, we've had a somewhat unusual 18 months to two years. Um, but what I think it has foregrounded is something that people have tended to forget, which is that infection is the great killer of older people, particularly older men. You know, we had, I forget whether it's 60,000 or 80,000 excess deaths from the flu among older people in 2018 in the UK. That's excess, not total. And that passed by as though nothing had happened. And so I think what the COVID epidemic has brought sharply into focus, perhaps too sharply in my view, with its focus on a coronavirus, is just how vulnerable older people are to infections in total. 160-fold increase in um, pneumonia deaths, 300 fold increase in GI tract infections. So, if you wanted to make a difference to the health of older people, which is why I do what I do, that's an axis that we should be targeting. And if the justification for not targeting it now has escaped anybody, then I presume they've been living in the backwoods in Oregon for a while. Because, again, one of the things that is also sitting under this is the big problem, a long-standing problem with the older immune system is that a lot of the people who are vulnerable to infections also don't respond to vaccines. And that makes perfect sense because you need to have a functional immune system to do two things, fight off bugs and respond to a vaccination. <laughs> and so, the, you know, and if you look, for example, at people who've been double vaccinated for COVID, you have this perfect exponential set of case numbers. It's the older, it's overwhelmingly older people who've been double vaccinated who then go on to get COVID. And so we need, if we're serious, if we're finally getting serious about protecting older people's health, 
then we need to get serious about rejuvenating older people's immune systems. So I think we could do that. I really do.